Welcome to the fourth week of the Open Online Economic History course. Today we will have Ángel Alvarado, who will be lecturing on independence and its economic effects. Ángel is a senior fellow at the Department of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is the managing director of the Latin American Project at the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. Please, Ángel. Thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen well? Yes. Okay, great. So well, today uh, we are gonna talk about independence and state building, a long process that is the beginning of the countries of Latin America, the new countries at that time. And in this process, I would like to talk a little bit about the state building as a main process that determines a lot of the trajectories of these economies. So I would like to start talking about the origins of independence. Uh, and this is a letter of Juan Vicente Bolívar, the father of Simón Bolívar, one of the wealthiest families in Caracas, a part of the Mantuano uh, group, Mantuano where the 0.5% uh, population of Caracas means the, the richest people, not just the 1%, the 0.5%. Uh, Juan Vicente Bolívar uh, had uh, three cattle ranch, one indigo plantation, one sugarcane plantation, two cocoa plantation, four houses in Caracas, one house in one house in, in La Guaira, in the beach. So Bolivar, Bolivar family was very important, very rich. And he wrote this letter one year before um, Simon Bolivar born to Francisco de Miranda. This is Francisco de Miranda. And in that letter, he expressed the intent done treat all Americans, no matter their class, rank, or circumstances, as if they were bill slave people. And referring to Miranda, you are the firstborn son whom the motherland expects this important service. That service is or was the independence. So who is Jose de Galvez? So the intendant uh, uh, treat all Americans as slaves, as a slave people. So the intendant report to Jose Galvez. And Jose Galvez is this guy who was trying to lead the Bourbon reforms in Spanish America. That was an effort uh, of the crown to centralize the, the fiscal policy, increase the revenues of the state, and at the end, creates, create some kind of state building or increase the state capacity. So uh, he were complaining with Francisco Miranda. Francisco Miranda was an agent of Pitt, the prime minister of England, a very close friend of Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, John Adams said about Francisco Miranda that is a, the best connected person that he ever met. He was general of the French Revolution. He participated actively in the French Revolution, was the governor of Belgium and was lover as Catherine the Great. So this guy is a revolutionary guy of the 19th, the 19th century. Uh, and he was Venezuelan. And Juan Vicente Bolívar, the father of Simon Bolívar was, was expecting, expecting of him the revolt of the independence. Remember that just before uh, that letter, Mm, the Mantuanos, the local elite of Caracas, beaten the Royal Guipuzcoan Company of Caracas, beaten in some part Galvez policy and Bourbon reforms, and they were empowered. He felt a lot of confidence to create a, a movement. But behind that, that movement, we, we need to understand that something were happening that is the Bourbon reforms in America. So what we see the sentiment at the late 18th century is a sentiment of dissatisfaction with the reforms among the native born classes, in this case, Mantuanos in Caracas, local elites with Spain 
bourbon reforms. So as a big uh, as a big uh, revolution, sometimes are pre were preceded with fiscal reforms. This is Jose de Galvez, the guy who was trying to impulse these reforms. And this is Francisco de Miranda. This is a paint by Arturo Michelena. That is a paint in the Gallery of Art of Caracas. And this is Francisco Miranda in Yale, in Cadiz, uh, in La Carraca prison, uh, where he died. So, uh, you know, Francis, uh, 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 Juan Vicente Bolívar referring to Francisco Miranda expects this important service. What service he were referring? Well, this is a service, the Colombia project. What does it mean? Well, this is a project by Francisco Miranda to create one country from the Mississippi River, California to Argenta Argentina. This one country in 1798. In fact, uh, he, Francisco Miranda, looked for money in the US to invade Venezuela before the independence war to try to create or uh, uh, make this project possible. And this is the project of, of Simon Bolivar. You see that is very similar. So Bolivar not was not the, the you know the, the person who thinks about the independence of, of Spanish America was Francisco Miranda, the first one who created this Colombia project. Why the name? The name comes from Columbus, of, uh, Christopher Columbus in Greek, which is Colombia project. That is one country in Spanish America. The project of Oliver was very similar. This is an fictionic Congress of Panama project by Bolivar. And you see the difference is that Bolivar believed that United States of America should be part of this process of the one country and as well as Brazil. And we know this project was uh, not possible in, in reality. So in the reading of independence, uh, we see the bourbon reforms that try to, to impose many reforms. And you see response from the uh, Spanish American colonies. You see, for example, Tupac Amaro movement. That is a, a movement, create, uh, you know, in the reading of this movement, we can see tax conflicts, racial connotations, and another in Peru, Tupac Amaru, is a, a very indigenous movement. And you see another movement in Santander, specifically in El Socorro, uh, in Colombia, named Los Comuneros, referring to similar movement in the 16th century in Castile, that is the, the movement of communes or the commons. So all oh, these uh, reactions had some uh, tax and racial connotations. So taxes are at the heart of the disconformity among the indigenous and the local elites. In the context of independence, also you have the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and Haiti Revolution, which is part, of course, of Latin America, as we see in the first lecture. But Haiti had a different um, path to the independence, was a separate process that began in 1791 and finished in 1804. Of course, Haiti prevent the revolution, that kind of revolution in plantation economies as well in the economies of the colony that used to have a lot of indigenous population. In the ideas, the ideas behind the region of independence, we have the movement of enlightenment in Europe, the encyclopedies movement, of course, the philosophers. And you see that that intellectual movement influenced a lot in Francisco de Miranda, Belgrano in Argentina, Nariño in Colombia, Gual España, and España uh, in, in Venezuela. And in the economic, as economic doctrine, we can see the Adam Smith ideas and the promotion of free trade at the core of all the justification of the movement of independence. You see here some rebellions uh, during, the, uh, during the 17th century. In Latin America, you see many rebellions in the countries like Peru, uh, the West 
side of Argentina, uh, Ecuador, and Mexico that is related with indigenous rebellion. So you see at uh, a, a countries that experience some kinds of revolutionary movement in the sense of discontent among the people who, who live there. In the international panorama uh, and, uh, and, um, and the regions of independence, we see an evolution from the Habsburg period in Spain to the Bourbon reforms with a new dynasty that trying to create a more centralized system. And you see in these, uh, in Latin America, this, this group uh, interacting with the Bourbon reforms, some groups losing some power, like the go local government that were replaced with the intendant, uh, you know, lead by that movement lead by Jose Galvez. And you see the consulados that uh, helped to govern the, the colonies in connection with Madrid, for example, the consulado of Mexico or Lima. And, uh, and you see the trade routes that were controlled by this consulado. And you see at the core of this equilibrium, the Napoleonic Wars. I'm gonna refer to this a little bit more in brief. And then in this uh, old process of independence, you see some groups, some local elite, you know, supporting a restoration of the Ferdinand VII in this case, after the Napoleonic War, and other groups promoting a revolution. Uh, who groups support this restoration or revolution depends sometimes a lot sometimes about the, the trade routes and the consulado at the reins around this, as we're gonna see in brief. As a consequence of independence, we see long century of wars, civil wars, fragmentation of the countries during the 19th century, the rise of, the rise of Caudillo. Caudillo is a horse back uh, lord, um, and uh, that leads uh, rebellions against the central power, leads the civil wars, and create a lot of troubles during the, the 19th century. We see persistent, persistent fiscal deficit, and of course, after the war of independence, what we have is debt, high level of debt. I would like to refer briefly to United States, the role of United States during the process of independence. Um, Spain was in, 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 in war with Britain uh, um, just before the independence time and Britain blockade a lot of, uh, disrupt the commerce and the colonies need to trade for example, the, the local elite complain because they don't have wine or wheat to celebrate mass, for example. So they need to, to trade with neutrals. So for example, Cuba and Venezuela had the right to trade at the beginning of the 19th century with United States. With the United States, the trade was booming just before the independence, exchange not just goods and service, as well books and ideas, especially the ideas of Thomas Paine, the speeches of Adams, Jefferson, Washington, all circulate across the continent and the model of revolution offer an alternative to the local elite, an alternative to the French revolution. In fact, Miranda wrote this just before the Comercio Libre. We have before our eyes two great examples, the American and French revolution. Let us prudently imitate the first and carefully shun the second. So America, the, the, the institution of America was a role model for, for, the, for the local elite as an alternative of Napoleon and Ferdinand VII. They have the alternative of the example of United States. This is a nice book if you want to know a, a little bit more about the trade, Venezuela trade with the United States during the time of the revolutions, sustaining empire but Edward Pompeian. Pompeian. So this is briefly the, the, the War of Independence, San Martin for the South, Bolivar in the North, one army after the meet, the met of Bolivar and San Martin in Guayaquil, and the final war in Ayacucho by, by Sucre. So basically this is the, oh, the theater of operations of the War of Independence of South America. This is Bolivar by Hilde Castro, in, in words of Bolivar, the best portrait of himself. 
These are not, these are portrayed by Hilde Castro's wild, a Peruvian uh, painter, royalist of Jose San Martin. And this is independence of Mexico. Uh, this is the, the operations of uh, Hidalgo that begins here in Dolores with the Grito of Dolores. That is at the beginning of independence of Mexico. This is uh, Morelos uh, operations. We have Famina and this is Guerrero. Um, well, this is Os Miguel Hidalgo. Miguel Hidalgo was a priest as well as Morelos with the flag of the Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and this is uh, Iturbide that was the guy who finally with the plan de Iguala um, with uh, mm, Guerrero create, uh, uh, made possible the independence of mm, Mexico. You see here, this is a paint that, that, that is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art of Iturbide with a crown because Iturbide was declared himself as emperor of Mexico. Three biographies about Bolivar that I think is a very, very important uh, person of the history of South America as well, Latin America. This is by John Lynch, a British German master, a uh, German biographer, and Augusto Mijares, a Venezuelan one. So let's go to see a little bit more about the political economy behind the independence. I'm gonna make this briefly because Fernando did a well job in the last class, in fact, in the addendum about this, but just to know what had happened in uh, Spain uh, at that time, especially in the colony, Spain was, uh, uh, was a bargaining empire. It does mean that negotiate with the British royalties, the captain general, the taxes, uh, as well as the kingdom, so as bargaining state empire was very decentralized and the taxation wasn't uniform and the negotiation was uh, in closed door. It means that you don't have a parliament like a British parliament to discuss the taxes. So you have a private negotiation bargaining empire. So, you know, what we learn in the, in the school, especially in Latin America, we learn the romantic view of the independence. independence. So today I wanna to talk a little bit more about the political economy behind that because it's not just a romantic view. We have uh, taxes uh, behind this fiscal, uh, fiscal policy. And, uh, and that is a very important, especially from the economic perspective to understand the, 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 the independence war of Latin America. So you see in the political economy of independence, Bourbon fiscal and government reforms, as I as I referred before with Jose de Galvez, we see the Napoleon's invasion to Spain that creates a vacuum of, of power and create opportunity of people. So the elites had the opportunity to follow Jose Bonaparte, the brother of Napoleon, the, 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 the choice to follow Ferdinand, Ferdinand VII that was, you know, that they made at the beginning of the process of independence or a third way to create a new states. And you see in this model, the competition intra, intra elites be, between merchant guilds, guilds, church and law owners. So in the economy of Latin America, you have mining, trading, uh, trading co uh, colonies like Buenos Aires and Caracas, and you see mining as Mexico and Peru. You see these agents, and the crown govern this uh, this the, this colony with traders and miners through the guilds and create a balance of power because that guilds uh, permits the crown to govern these uh, these colonies. So you have uh, before the seven war, uh, the seven war, the seven years war, you have uh, a Spanish trading network very safely, working very well, no pirates, um, the mining industry booming, doing very well, and the trade monopolized in Seville, Mexico, and Lima. This is uh, basically the, the way the Spanish trade was very centralized. 
and uh, our economy is very integrated. This is the production of silver in Mexico. This is uh, the production of mercury in Spain. And you see a strong correlation between mercury and silver. So mercury produced in, in, the, in, center, in center Spain and Mexi silver and Spain, in Mexico. And you see very well integrated economy. So uh, that creates problems to Mexico in case of the eruption of trade. But disruption came with the Seven Year War. England became becomes the prime maritime power, uh, the the new hegemon. Then you have the French Revolutionary Wars, and then you have Napoleon, the Napoleonic turmoil that creates a vacuum. So Spain had a, an equilibrium, and equilibrium was chalked three times uh, by different uh, international contexts at that triggers the war of, of independence. A book, if you want to know a little bit more about this, this process, is this one, The Spanish Atlantic War in the 18th century by Cotty and Andrian, War on Bourbon Reforms. So the Bourbon Reforms basically uh, is a new, new dynasty in Spain that tried to create a modernized, a centralized government. You see many actions and they follow at that time. And they opened the door to free trade reforms and that um, create new merchant guilds. You used to have just the merchant guild of Lima and Mexico. And now you have merchant guilds in Caracas and Buenos Aires, for example, and that create put in front of the elite new incentives to trade and to trade not just with Spain. Bourbon reforms increased, this is the revenue during the light Spanish empire. So you see it at increase in the colonies, the revenues. So the reforms were working very well. So in terms of revenues, but Spain as a whole empire was left behind England. You know, see here the revenues of England that were, was start to increase at the mid 17th century and Spain start to increase at the end of the 19th century. So Bourbon reforms was doing well in the Spanish America, but was not enough and was in fact too late to create a state capacity to protect the trade and increase the capacity of the state in the, in the colonies. So if you want a state capacity, you need uh, not just revenues, uh, taxes centralization also uh, you need the limited government and you see that Netherlands did it and England very at the beginning and Spain did uh, limited government very late in the 19th century that coincides with the increase of the uh, the rebellions of Spain. So but well the, the effort of the Bourbon was important in in terms of create create revenues. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so mm, the centralized flood of Spain was not enough. So, you know, they decentralized the, the trade with, uh, with Spain between the colonies as Spain. Uh, and that centralization was a solution, but create tensions and opportunities among the local, local elites. And when the empires collapsed at the end of the 19th century, because Spain was engaged in war with Britain and France, the crown bankruptcy and changed uh, to a more predatory mode that created more discontent among the elites and created more incentive for uh, uh, disintegration of the empire, which means largest fiscal and monetary union known to that to that date. So behind independence, we have to see trade rates as a source, important source of political stability or instability. We see more that countries that broke, you know, the, the control of the crown. We have to see before that the implosion of the empire uh, that were threatened by different wars at the same time in the late 19th century. And we see the Bourbon reform fail to re reconfigure the empire economic structure. So at the end, 
what we see is a, a, a very predatory mode of Crown of Spain trying to finance the war uh, and avoid the, the collapse. I would like to refer a little bit about the particular case of Brazil. The le next lecture on Thursday will be just about the independence of Brazil in the 19th century of Brazil. So I just want to refer that the independence of Brazil was not a revolution, was a continuity with the imperial government. In fact, when Napoleon invades Portugal, King Joao moved with the family and the court the and the and the zoo, the animals of the zoo and the 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 the, the trees of the of the volcanic garden of Lisbon all to Rio de Janeiro and create a new empire there. So the empire core moved to Rio de Janeiro and Brazil had a peaceful independence. So that means that was a smooth process. The creation of Brazil was not a revolution and you know long lasting war and that create more continuity. And that continuity as well create the incentives not to change the institutions. So we see that the slavery still co continues in Brazil to the late 19th centuries. So what we have after independence? We have these countries, new countries, uh, in the, that is basically what used to be the Spanish colonies. We see in the terms of economic transition, the end of the slavery not, was not immediately, but we see the end of this institution. We see the liberal reforms uh, that in terms of lands mean the expropriation of the land of the church that was very wealthy at that time, the privatization of the communal lands of indigenous communities, and, uh, and the expropriation or privatization of these lands was not, uh, you know, fostered by ideas of public policy, was, it was more the ideas of the liberal terms that we need to privatize these and promote the, the, the change and the, in some sense, Manchesterian, and, Manchesterian liberal capitalism. Another, another issue that we see topic that we see in the economic transition from the colonial economy to the new republic economy is the move into the frontier areas, the development of the interior part of, the, of these countries. And we see free trade, very important, the promotion of free trade that uh, would be important in the late, late 19th century with the the, the 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 drops of the freight cost, cheap cost, and of course the taxes that is very well related with free, free trade. So what about uh, slavery? We see the the abolition of the slavery very early in Dominican Republic. In fact, this abolition of the slavery was promoted by Haiti that invades Dominican Republic, and it's the core of the the foreign policy of Haiti to promote the end of the slavery. In fact, Haiti sent money to Bolivar under the condition that Bolivar uh, suppress the slavery institution. So we see the abolition of the slavery very early in Chile, Mexico, well, these countries, and very late in Brazil, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Why? Well, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Brazil used to be plantation economy. And Puerto Rico and Cuba uh, didn't experience a movement of independence. Uh, they remain as part of the uh, Spanish crown to the late 19th century. But you see very early the end of the slavery after the independence. Another thing that we see is the fragmentation after independence. And so the wars of independence open a box of Pandora. So if Caracas could become independent of Madrid, why could Quito not become independent of Caracas? And an example is the Great, Great Colombia. This is Great Colombia. So the initial Colombia project of Miranda and then Bolivar well, was reduced to these countries. That is now Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And uh, one of the, 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 the incentives for fragmentation is, well, the capital of this new country named Colombia then 
Grand Great Colombia, but that time was Colombia. That is a derivation of the Colombia project. Was in Bogota here. So imagine how difficult it is to move from Bogota to Caracas with a post, for example. So these uh, areas are very not well integrated, long distances, important geographical barriers. So that create incentive for fragmentation. As well, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, intra-elite competition, regionalism, uh, racial issues about the composition of every society. So there is a lot of incentives for the fragmentation. So important question is why not Brazil? Why Brazil uh, keep very compact? And, and yeah, we have to say that uh, all the most important cities of Brazil is in the coast and Brazil was uh, integrated as a union before the independence. We see in Spanish American that, well, some of these countries were very united around Madrid, but not united by themselves. Between Caracas and Quito, there is not much connection. Between Buenos Aires uh, and, uh, and Asuncion, there is not much more connection. The connection were around the, the Madrid, that is the, the metropolis. Bolivar was very upset about this uh, incapacity to unify in South America. This is a letter one month before Bolivar died, letter wrote to Juan Jose Flores, a Venezuelan who governed at that time the Ecuador, which was part of Gran Colombia. And Bolivar was very sad, was sick and wrote this. I want to, I want to, well, I want to highlight something of this. For example, Bolivar said that America is ungovernable for us. Uh, the only thing you can do in America is emigrate. Very sad. Bolivar was thinking to emigrate when he wrote this letter, emigrate to Europe, but he died before he tried to go out in Santa Marta. And he make a prophetic uh, predictions about South America. These countries will fall inevitable in the hands of umbril masses and then pass almost imperceptibly into the hands of pity tyrants and all colors and races. Uh, well, you see that was very difficult to Bolivar to keep the unity of these, of these countries. This is a great novel about that time of Bolivar, the last days of Bolivar, the final trip of Bolivar uh, from Bogota to Santa Marta through the Magdalena River, very beautiful description of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The name of the book is El General in su Laberinto. So, <clears throat> uh, North et al. wrote a comparison between the independence process and the consequence between Latin American countries and United States. So, the conclusion of North, which is a big name the, in the in the science and economics, is that well, political order is not a public god. We, it's not automatic. You have a country, then you have a um, political order. It's not in that way that this works. Uh, it's not automatically. And in fact, it was very difficult for Bolivar and then the other uh, president of, of Latin American countries after independence to create political order. And that order is what we know now, state capacity and credible commitments, arrangement that continues during the time. And if you don't have that state capacity, what you face is destructive conflicts, predatory economy, no property rights. Uh, and, and you see in middle of that turmoil, the new elite trying to govern the new countries with no experience doing that and with a lot of intra-elite conflicts with high stakes around the government and the fight against centralism and federalism and the rain seeking around the centralism, what means in this case, the ports that were the source of revenues for the new countries. So uh, after saying this, I would like to talk a little bit about the economic performance of these countries after independence. So, trying to answer 
that Jesus made at the beginning of this course in the first lecture about when did Latin America le fall behind? It's a very interesting question. I would like, I, I try to answer this. So we have uh, this literature, some literature that said that the, the, the Latin America fell behind the colonial period. We have this author that you can consult. And we have in the, the post-independence period, this author that believed that Latin America fell behind during the time we are starting today. Maybe the most important one is North Summer Hill and Wenzgas that we, I just comment in the two slides ago and the work of Card, uh, Cardenas 2010. So what? After independence, uh, in the positive uh, side, we have the prospect of free trade that excite non-Iberian powers, especially Britain. And uh, in the negative side, we see the end of the custom and monetary unions that used to have those countries during the Spanish empire. We see in the turmoil as a consequence of the war of independence, the, 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 the mines and haciendas, states, and the production unity of agricultural unit production were not, was not maintained and the physical capital was scarce. So we see some collapse of these, uh, of these units. And as well, we see the collapse of the fiscal system that used to be weak, but were doing better as we see in the former Bourbon reforms. The people, especially the elite, would not want to pay more taxes, especially the royal taxes. In this case, Alcabala was a very important tax. The people uh, avoid or don't want to pay more taxes. And uh, something that is important here is that taxes means for the local elite, absolutism means uh, Ferdinand VII means uh, 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 Bourbon reforms, especially Mantuanos don't want to pay taxes. Okay, and uh, the end of the the custom the custom unions is an important thing that I want to remark today. We see here country by country and the market extra regional and intra regional market. So you can see here, for example, that Mexico produced sugar and textile to sell, to, to be sold in, to be sold in the colonies. So these textiles went to Venezuela or Colombia or Ecuador. So we see an intra regional market inside the Spanish uh, American countries. So the people refer a lot about the extra regional market, but we see intra regional market. So the end of the union customs means the end of this intra regional trade that was important at that time. And that was a negative consequence of the independence. But at the same time, we see a great opportunities for these countries because the term of trade was very positive during the 19th century. So we can expect uh, uh, a lot of growth do after independence. Okay, we can see here the real GDP per capita, the Madison data set. And we can see here, for example, the case of Argentina that did well after the independence, very well at the end of the 19th century. It's the same case of Chile, so we see the peripheral economies, the trade-oriented uh, colonies doing very well. And we see for the same case of Venezuela, but especially Venezuela after the independence, before independence, Venezuela is, is, uh, experienced some stagnation. And we see the peripheral Argentina, Chile, and Venezuela uh, did very well after independence, or did well, not very well, did well. And we see some countries doing very bad after independence in the case of Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, that in the case of Mexico was a more dramatic one, lost 30% of his GDP in terms of per capita GDP. Uh, it's the same of Peru that then recuperate with the guano sector booming. But what we see in the case of Peru is a stagnation during the 18th century, then the 19th century, the case, same case of Mexico, they recuperated a little bit more at the end of the 19th century, and the same case of Bolivia. So you see at least 
two patterns. The big visa royalties, you know, uh, doing so bad, and the peripheral economies of Venezuela, Argentina, and Chile doing better. And you see here United States that increased a lot his GDP at the end of the 19th century and was superior. Uh, it's the same case uh, before the, in, the independence. You see, for example, the richest colony in this data set was Argentina in the, the beginning of the 19th century, but the United States was richer than Argentina and Mexico. So the, the question about when did Latin America fall behind? Well, in this data set, we see that Latin America fell behind before the independence, but we need more uh, figures to understand how well or how bad Latin America did during these times. This is a GDP, ratio GDP of US of, of, with, in comparison with the GDP of US. So we see, for example, Argentina. Argentina at that time, the GDP of Argentina uh, using this Wilmer Thomas data set was 50% of the US economy. And at the end, and at the middle of the 19th century, the GDP of Argentina was 51%, 52% of the GDP of the United States. So Argentina uh, didn't fall behind uh, United States. It's the same case of Chile that did better in terms of United States, Brazil, did uh, worse, so Brazil fell behind. Cuba didn't fall behind. Colombia fell behind, you see. Uh, Mexico fell behind. Peru, uh, keep it, his GDP in comparison with the United States in terms of, of uh, ratio. Venezuela did well uh, in comparison with the United States, but in aggregation, in aggregate, Latin America fell behind if we use all the data set, all the countries. But there is some heterogeneity inside this. So we can see a first group of Mexico, Colombia. We can put here Peru. There used to be a mining economies falling behind. The GDP of this, uh, the, the, the per capita growth GDP was zero after independence of Mexico and Colombia. In the case of Brazil, Cuba, and Venezuela, there is plantation economy uh, growth, 0.4%. That is weak, but growth. Uh, the best case in this is Cuba that didn't in, uh, make the independence at that time during the 19th century, so it used to be part of Spain crown. And you see, you see a third group, that is Argentina and Chile, didn't, doing better increase their, their GDP. So uh, Latin America fell behind, yes, but we see some heterogeneity in this sample. This is a Bertola and Ocampos uh, calculus about the GDP of Latin America. Finally, the question about if Latin America fell behind in comparison with other regions of the world. So the uh, GDP growth of Latin America during that time 1820 to 1870 is 0.5%. Well, Africa and Latin America did better than Africa, better than China, better than India, better than Japan, better than East Asia, better, the, more or less the same with former Europe, former uh, Soviet Union countries. So Latin America didn't fall behind in comparison with these countries. So Latin America fell behind with in comparison with Western Europe, West e European periphery, and United States. So what we have to say is, is all the region of the world fell behind United States, um, UK, France, and the Western countries, Western Europe in the 19th century, not just Latin America. In fact, Latin America did better than the rest of the world. But uh, Latin America uh, did not so bad, but experienced some problems. And one very old problem of Latin American countries is inflation. At that time, the basement of the currency. And we see recurrent debt defaults during the 19th centuries. 
And that is a consequence of the state capacity that we are gonna talk in brief. So we have an inflationary context and the land is the only safe asset. So as we know in economy, inflation is not, uh, is not you know, is a, is a, 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 a course in a context. And that context is debt. So what we have at the end of independence in Latin America is high level of debts. The consequence as, a, as at the end of the, of the war of independence, Latin America had a lot of casualties and a lot of debt. Why the Latin American countries were uh, unable to handle, to manage the debt? Well, firstly, the fiscal reforms failed to establish direct taxation. It was very compli complicated to, to do this into elite conflicts, political instability, a part of the tradition that taxes its absolutism of Spain and Mantuano opposing to this. So the fiscal reforms fail. And at the same time, there is an opportunity in London to issue debt and raise capital in the international market. Uh, London opened this window, uh, not just because the market was, was booming in, in London, in UK, but because they were afraid that Ferdinand VII reconquest, uh, recapture again these colonies. So they decided to support indirectly through the international market, these new countries. And the fiscal policies we have to say at that time, well, commit the, what we know now, the original scene, that is to issue debt in another currency that is not your currency. And uh, very soon after these countries uh, uh, issue debt, default. So look, uh, this is the treasury during the early 19th century. So you see the collapse of the revenues of these new countries. As you see here, there's a strong collapse, especially just before the independence because Spain was in war. And then after the independence, also in the case of Nueva Granada, for example, the revenues came to zero. So there is no capacity to collect taxes. And at the same time, you don't have the capacity for something like a direct taxation. So the opportunity that you have is to issue debt. There is no, no option because if you don't collect debt, and in fact, it's easy to collect debt, it's, is, it's easy to issue debt than collect taxes. So the opportunity opens in London and Venezuela, in this case, Colombia means Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama was the first one to issue debt and 84% the price of the, the bond. So it's uh, the first uh, the first debt issued in the international market in Latin America were those countries. And then again, Colombia to win, to won the war with more debt in better conditions. And we see, for example, Brazil, the first debt issued in 1824. And uh, interesting here, Brazil issued debt in very well to Russia. And this is important, Russia, because Russia had Brazil not just to with money, but to receive the recognition as an independent country after issue this debt. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we see is uh, original scenes. So this country rise capital in the international market in other uh, currency. They don't have the capacity to collect taxes. So what we see after issue debt is very brief after the issue debt, what we see is default. And we see after, just after the issue debt, these countries, we see that Argentina default his debt in 18, 18, 27, Chile 26, Mexico 27, and so on. So the, problem of Latin America with the debt is very old, is that the beginning of this state and is always more or less the same, is you don't have capacity to repay, you issue debt, you commit the original sins, 
and then you don't have with poor state capacity, but you see it's persistent fiscal deficit, the basement, and inflation. So the fiscal policy of Latin America was at uh, the beginning of this, those countries is issue debt, poor state capacity, and the source of revenues in uh, uh, the source were tariff wa that was in control of the central government and represent in, so, uh, in average 70% of the revenues of treasuries. More or less, the, the tariffs were, were collected in the ports, that means in the coast, and that create uh, in, in regional differences, inequalities, and conflict between the interior areas and the capital. Okay, um, this is quite funny. This is uh, a country named Pojais. Uh, was a country that supposed to be in the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras. It's a fake country that issued debt in London at that time. And the guy who issued that debt was Gregor, Gregor McGregor, cacique of Pojais. Uh, and Gregor McGregor was a military from Scotland that, particip that, that came with Francisco de Miranda and Bolivar at the First Republic of Venezuela in 18, 1811. And he, go, he went to London and issued debt. And when he issued that debt, well, it was booming. Nobody asked about where is Pojais, where is Colombia, where is Ecuador. Well, what the people in London believe is that those countries are very rich. They have a lot of gold, silver. They have a strong capacity to repay. There is the first international debt in the modern history. So these guys issued debt. Of course, they default very briefly after they issued that, that debt. And, uh, and Pojais, what is Pojais? When the London bankers realized that Pojais didn't exist, you know, that closed the international market to, this, to these countries. This is a uh, external debt and default. So Pojais is omitted in this, in this, in this, in this table. But what we see is that after they issued the debt, very after that, very brief after that, we see the default of the debt. So no capacity to repay the debts of Latin American countries. And you see a special case of Honduras with long periods of default. The case uh, of um, um, Colombia is important, Venezuela with a long period of default. And Ecuador is another one with a long period of default. We see here the yield of the bonds. So it's uh, the return of the bonds. So we see, for example, the high yields on Colombia because the bonds were in default. Uh, and we see the other case is Chile that reduced the yield very briefly at the mid 19th century. And why this is important? How do we explain these returns or, 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 or the yields of the, of the bonds? Well, this is the, 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 the bonds of uh, Argentina in London. So what we see here is that the price of the bond that is inverse to the yield uh, decrease. So the yield increase when we see this reduction here, when the Argentinian debt uh, went to default and we see the recuperation of the price of the bonds when Argentina renegotiate their debt. So uh, what we see if, if you want to um, attract, to increase the foreign investment in your country, you have to get out of the default. And that means recuperate and renegotiate the debt. So Argentina is the case that at the end of the, uh, the mid 19th century, they renegotiated the debt. It's the same case of other countries. The first one, the first country that renegotiated debt after default was Chile. For that reason, he had better performance. And for that reason, Chile received more foreign investment because they renegotiated the debt and received more investment after, uh, right after they uh, issued debt and default. 
the same case Argentina at the mid 19th century. And you see that the countries uh, after this mid 19th century, Latin American countries receive more money, fresh money after they uh, renegotiate the debt. I think it's important, I want to come back here a little bit because this debt issued by Colombia is to win the, to win the war. In some case, in 1824. So this debt uh, basically was issued and used, expanded, expanded uh, to won the independence war with the Ayacucho War in 1824, uh, led by uh, 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 Gran Mariscal de Ayacucho, Antonio José de Sucre. So this debt, the initial debt, is to win, to won the war. Then you have another period of default. Pojais and those stories. And then you have another period uh, of debt in the mid 19th century with the renunciation of the debt. And those debt was used not just to finance the army, but to finance public uh, infrastructure, sometimes railways. And that was very uh, important to these, to these countries especially because it's not debt to, to, to win the war, to win the war, but to create capacities in the state and to promote development. Okay. A um, couple of minutes more to talk about debt. Uh, we, we saw a little bit about the, the fiscal policy in Latin American countries. And the fiscal policy was very regressive. So we don't see something like a progressivism in the tax policy because it was very difficult to tax the elite because the elite believed that taxes means absolutism uh, and that creates important problems to, for example, to promote property tax as we see in the United States or Canada, there is not something like some issue, like some, some taxes, like a property tax in Latin America. Another issue is like a property tax means to create a state capacity, but as well to integrate and transform the periphery of the country, the interior part. So property tax means that go from Colombia to Medellin to tax the paisas. And we know that paisas has the opportunity to raise an army and rebel against that attempt of the, 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 the Bogota in this case. So the equilibrium in Latin American countries with the caudillos, the caudillos uh, and, the, and the long lasting civil wars create a few opportunities to create something like property tax, direct tax section, and as well, the uh, local elites I'm going to refer to the capital elites don't, don't want uh, to have that representation. Uh, that means sometimes the promotion of federalism. So I'm going to skip a little bit this debate that is important, but around this issue of fiscal policy, there is a lot of literature that come from the political science that is very important how the equilibrium in Latin America uh, didn't permit the creation of something that we see in, in North America, progressivism, system, direct taxation, and representation as a consequence of that. Okay, uh, having said that, and I think I'm going well with the time, uh, after saying that about debt, I want to talk about state building. That is one of the problems that Latin American states still has. So after the end of the First Republic in Venezuela, um, well, there is a debate, but Miranda was betrayed by Bolivar, and Bolivar put Miranda in the hands of uh, the Spaniard um, authorities in, Port, in La Guaira port and um, Miranda was translated to, translate to, was sent to, to Cadiz. And Miranda said that day, 
I'm going to say that in Spanish and then translate. Bochinche, bochinche, esta gente no es capaz, sino de hacer bochinche, referring to the, the local elite. So bochinche is a mess, mess. These guys just are capable to make a mess. So there is a mess what we see at the end of independence uh, as a chaos, as a anarchy. And we, uh, these states fail uh, in their, you know, attempt to create states. So a state capacity describes the ability of the state to collect taxes, enforce the law, order, and provide public goods. So Latin American countries of independence fail in this. States and the state capacity, of course, facilitate economic activity in many ways. Proper, you know, the, 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 the institutional framework, secure property rights, basic market regulations, uh, resolution of disputes in the courts, administri administri administrative infrastructure, etc. So if you want a state capacity, you need fiscal centralization, so you need centralization, and there is another important point that in American, the dominant ideology thing, especially in the late, in the second part of 19th century is federalism, and federalism is against centralization. And that, uh, of course, mm, in, was, well, was very difficult for the, 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 the conserv conserv conservadores to promote that fiscal centralization, limited government, so parliaments, and at the end of this process, fiscal centralization plus limited government, what you have the rubinius, which means a state capacity. So economies uh, of Latin America uh, didn't have, and still has a strong problem with state capacity. So state capacity permits to govern in a strong, cohesive and constrained that a way that overcome the vested interests. So vested interests were in the core of this political process and vested interests of the local elite, you know, um, avoid the creation of something like a uniform tax system. And what you see is weak states in the 19th century with a lot of rent seeking, corruption and civil war. And maybe this is the most important legacy of the independence, independence war. There is a law, a, a abundant literature to talk about this and the effect of the state capacity in the economic performance in the long run. Best in person maybe is the first one, but you have others as uh, the state and as active participant in the develop, developing modern capitalist system, and the promotion of industrial revolution as the work of Mokir. Uh, and for example, <clears throat> the, as, as well, the, the fragmentation as a consequence of state capacity. And of course, when we are talking about civil wars and conflict that we see along the 19th century, we have to see or talk about the weak capacities that the state had. So the question is why? Why Latin America had Weak, weak state capacity. So um, there, is, there are many explanations that is more in the political science that talk about, about this. But the first thing that I would like to say is that this problem persists today. The favela, the barrio, Colonia Popular, or Villa Miseria, where this is shanty towns in Latin America, slums, are consequence of the state weakness. This is, my, this is Petare in East Caracas. Uh, as you may know, before I come to Peng, I was, I served this district as a congressman. So this is my district. I've been working here for so long. And you see this part of Caracas that is uh, Petare, it's a slum, shanty town. And this is um, Caracas. So you see inequalities, but behind that, what you see is uh, the state capacity. Here you see the state, the police patrol these streets, more or less. <laughs> uh, the service, public services are better here. 
And here, what you see is no presence of the state. So the state capacity is low in all those areas in comparison with Europe or United States, but especially in these areas or more inequality, the state capacity is reduced, it's very low. Before I, well, I was a member of the Congress, I served this co city council. I wear a lot here. I know all those streets. And, uh, and one of my concern is the, the lack of a state capacity to do more to resolve the problems. And, and well, if we want to, to, to see the trajectory of state capacity, we have to low, go to the independence time. So as we uh, have been saying, Latin American states fail to provide essential functions, public goods, control of internal violence, internal violence, that is uh, guns, homicide rates are related with the state capacity and that is very, is very high levels of Latin American, the homicides of the most important cities is related to state weakness. So why was very difficult to create the state capacity? Well, was one explanation by Chronic and Rodriguez. Rodriguez will be talking in the nine, the ninth week in the, as a special guest, is the intra-class conflict. That is the division between the local elites, the regionalism, the league division, and the racial issues around that creates intra-conflict between the elites, the elites, the region fighting themselves. So that's one explanation of the incapacity to create state the state building in Latin America. Another explanation by Tilly, that is a classical work that said, but basically that the war created states. War created states and the states make the war. That is the case, special case of Europe. So because in United States you didn't experience a war, or you know, maybe some one of you can say, whoa, we experienced a lot of war. Yeah, but disorganized war. And the organized war in the sense that we see in Europe is what Tilly thinks is the origins of the states. So maybe you can say, well, there is a lot of wars in Latin America, and indeed we can see many, but all those wars are very, what we can say, disorganized war, limited war, not total war as we see in the Prussian uh, nation in Europe. Maybe the most organized war was this one at the 1861 in the Try the Triple Alliance War between Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, and uh, with a lot of casualties. So if we see the casualties, we can see that the most important um, international death that this region experienced was during the, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, which means the independence war. But this war was not, uh, was before the state was created. And for that reason, Centeno, what is a theorist in the political science about the state creation, the state building in Latin America, believed that, well, they, those war were in the wrong time to create the state capacity for Latin American countries. And the other time with a lot of casualties, international death, death in international conflict, is this one, the Triple Alliance. And some people think that because of that, the countries that make that war, this is one, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, create better states at the end of the 19th century. So while well, maybe you can think, well, there is, a, there is a very complicated to create the states, it's what we need is a war because this, this region are very proud not to be involved in the war of the, the 20th century, and yet, there is a there is a there is um that is good to know to know that, but that maybe is uh, uh, is, uh you know prevent the these countries to create uh, better states. <clears throat> 
other aspects that limit the creation of uh, um, of states is the local elites, uh, especially when we are talking about traditional tax rights, as we refer the taxes means for those elites absolutism. And the other thing uh, that prevent and that in American countries to to issue to 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 create a state is the opportunity to issue debt in international markets very early and the incapacity to collect taxes. Uh, it's easy to issue debt than collect taxes, so it's easy then to be in, in debt and not to create a uniform tax uh, system. Well, this is another about major in American and the wars in Latin America. <clears throat> so another thing that I would like to refer is why didn't Latin America uh, experience uh, a, a war or international war that permits to create a state if we want if we can talk in in these in these terms. And one thing is the Pax Britannica. So. In some sense, during the 19th century, Latin American countries, the new Latin American countries, were protected by Britain. Britain see Latin American countries free trade and new markets in the time of industrial revolution. Britain proposed was not to replace Spain as a new colony metropolis, but defend the continent, the continent from France to trade and create more market for their manufactured goods. And in fact, Britain had an important role in independence, a mixed role, you know, in the dot, dot in, in, in both behind the scenes. For example, Britain didn't send weapons to Bolivar directly uh, because they had an alliance with Spain, but through the Danish colonies, that means a small islands in the Caribbean, Britain sent some weapons. So Britain was behind the scenes, we can say, from the very beginning of the new, this, this, this new state. So in some sense, Britain avoid, uh, protect the new countries to make or to be involved in international works and wars and that prevent these countries to create the state capacity in the modern terms. There is another theory uh, by um, Masuka that he said that these countries succeed in the state formation, but failing in state building. What does it mean? Well, the state formation is a process during the 19th century of the territory consolidation and violence monopolization that more or less was these countries succeed some very early in the 19th century, like Chile or Venezuela, others in the late 19th century as Colombia in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, state formation is not the same of a state building. A state building is capacity to provide public goods. So these countries uh, succeed in the state formation, but fail in the state building. And that state formation was not promoted by war, as in the case of Europe, but by trade. So we can see not war-led state formation path, but trade-led. And in the case of these countries, more related to ports, in the case of Buenos Aires, Rio, and, and, and Valparaíso, the port uh, permits the formation of the states. In the case of Peru, Venezuela, and Guatemala, the lords, that means caudillos. And in the case of Mexico, Colombia, and Uruguay, the party, the liberal or conservative party. So what we see in the 19th century is not state building, but yes, we have a state formation, new states. And the question of why, and uh, I think uh, we have, I think, five more minutes, is the conditions under Latin American countries were created, um, and, you know, uh, uh, create uh, a path. And that conditions were, uh, uh, for example, in the Europe countries were created in times of anarchy, Latin American countries, uh, international anarchy. Latin American countries were created in times of hierarchy. That means Pax Britannica. 
uh, Latin American countries, the elites needs market to survive. The European countries need war to survive. So to survive, the European countries create internal taxation uh, under the external military threat and trade in Latin American countries uh, live from the revenues of customs due to global trade opportunities in the time of the first globalization. And uh, Europe incorporates the periphery, the regional areas uh, with transformation, not the case of Latin America. So as a consequence of this, you have strong states in Europe and weak states in Latin America. If you want to know more of this, this is a good book by Masuka, Sebastian Masuka, 2021, uh, in the particularities of the formation of the state Latin America and the fail to create a state building. Finally, I would like to dedicate, well, there is uh, all the conflicts between the, the faction of Latin America that prevent of the creation of the state, conservatives and liberals. Uh, but I think I don't have much more time to do this. You wanna have the, the slides. Finally, I would like to, take, to talk about as a consequence of the, 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 the weak states that we have Latin America, maybe is one of the explanation of the high level of inequality that we have in these countries. There is a, what is important in this graph is that we see the inequality as measured by the Gini index in the, uh, here, in the, in the Y axis and the X axis, we have the measure of income. Well, and you see, for example, that Mexico, West, New Spain and Chile were very unequal in the late 17th century uh, and the 18th century in the case of Chile. So you can say, well, these countries were very, but we experienced high level of inequality. That's true in this measure, of course, by Williamson. But other countries were, were more equal or at least in the average of other countries, in the case of Peru and Brazil. So we cannot say that Latin American countries were very unequal all the time. So it's more a recent phenomena or saying in different words, we see that whole land of Britain that is here where are more equal now and why Latin American countries still experience high level of inequality. So one explanation of state capacity that I have been saying before, but referring to the trends in the inequality of Latin America, we have to say that the colony create more unequal societies, as we can see here. Then after the independence, we see that redu reduction of inequality till the end of the 19th century. So uh, in the old 19th century, we see the reduction of inequalities. So that is positive of this process, but we can see a lot of the heterogeneity in this process. So we have, a, it is a bad uh, measure of inequality. So we see in, in heterogeneity, we see, for example, here in Venezuela that experience a reduction of inequality till the mid 19th century that coincides with a high rate growth during that time. And you see other countries like Argentina that increase the inequality. So we see the reduction of inequality, but we can see we, we, we can see a lot of heterogeneity in this process. This is another measure by Williamson of inequality. It's a ratio between land rents and unskilled wage. So we see, for example, the index number here at the time of the brink of independence, and we see the reduction of inequality using this measure during the 19th century. That is this measure that I see here, but in other, uh, another way to treat another treatment. So one conclusion is these countries reduce inequality during that time, but not as the level that we see during the 20th century in other Latin American countries, in other European countries. So maybe one explanation is the persistence of the, in, in, of the, of the slavery that was very important, especially in the case of Brazil, that you see some correlation with uh, slavery and inequality that is more clear here with 
road correlation and controls, it's very clear that inequality is related with the institution of slavery. And another thing that is important is the education attainment that was very high at the end of the 19th century in, in North American countries and very low in, Lat in, in Latin American countries. And that means maybe the weak state capacity to tax, to increase the revenues of the state and to spend in something as an education. If you invest more in education, that is the case of Canada and United States, you have less level of inequality. And you see that Canada do, is doing bef, bef better than the United States, maybe because they didn't experience the slavery institution. So that's it. Um, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, no problem. So thank you for your lecture. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have not been answered yet. So we've been answering some of them. So Martin asks, some borders in Central America are very straight. In other parts of the world, that type of borders create unrest on both sides of the border. Do straight created states mean that it's more peaceful or has there still been some unrest and civil conflicts? Well, <clears throat> I think th this, this topic about um, trade is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a new topic that we have to study to study more. And uh, for example, the Central American countries didn't experience uh, a war as we see in South America, especially in the case of Colombia in the independence war. And, uh, and uh, well, I think, I think we have to study a little bit more about this. I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience about Central American countries, but I think the country that did better in Central America uh, in the terms of state capacity is, is um, Costa Rica. And I think we have to study a little bit more that case and how Costa Rica create a better, a better state. Okay, would you consider the vertical and absolute relationships that the elites had with the rest of the country in terms of taxation, that they also reflected labor practices, for example, the haciendas or later textile mills that just continued the two class systems without a true middle class? Well, we, we have that. We have the, the class relation, of course, the hacienda and that relation. There is a, I didn't refer to that topic that is complicated, but it's related with racism, the level of racism in Latin American countries, the uh, heterogeneity that you see in the composition of the population and the afraid of the local elites to empower this uh, part of the society. So that is a one factor that affects, you know, the creation of the state, the unification of the tax system. But uh, besides that, I think it's as well very important, the regionalism, the conflict between the regions, the incapacity to incorporate the periphery. And sometimes I think there is some correlation between that and geography. The isolation, for example, thinking about Colombia, that is very has a, a, a important geographical barriers. So there is an interaction between that, you know, heterogeneity in the population composition, uh, regionalism fostered by uh, geographical um, geographical barriers, and as well the intra-conflict elites. So when you have a, a war. A uh, total war, as the case of Europe, the elites needs to unify to fight the external threat. Well, you don't have, you know, a war in that case, so the elite don't have the incentive to unify. So, and not just the elite, as well, all the population. So you need a different, more complicated way to unite your, your societies. And sometimes uh, these countries try to create a myth, foundational myth, uh, to unify the country. That is the case, for example, of Bolivar. Bolivar is trying to create the unification of the country ar around the heroes, not just Bolivar. All the heroes of Latin American countries are trying to be part of this effort to unify all the countries. I think it's a pending task in Latin America. 
there is a no easy task because nobody wants a, a total war, uh, but it has an important consequence in the fiscal system and as we have been saying in the state capacity. One thing that has surfaced across the questions that we have received is why British investors were so optimistic about Latin America in the early 19th century? <laughs> well, good, good question, I think. Um, one thing is like, um, not just when they were optimistic, they had the money, they had the production. Uh, Britain was in the middle of the industrial revolution. They have the necessity to create markets for their products is um, they had at that time, there is a transition between a Smithsonian growth model, that is markets and more markets, and the innovation model, you can say, in the, in the terms of creation of new activities and the industrial revolution, that is technological uh, growth model. But they need to, you know, to create market for their products. So, they were not so optimistic, in, but they need to create new markets. And Latin American were the first market that they had the opportunity to put. So there is a, a thing of coincidence of industrial revolution and the creation of new markets, the opening of a new market that were that that, that that time was closed by Spain, were open, was open, you know, immediately and suddenly and coincides with the industrial revolution. So I don't think it's uh, optimistic about Latin America. It's more the opportunity to trade with new markets. And the other thing is that as we saw, Latin America you know, was the country that growth more in the, in the world after the United States and Europe. So there is an important market to, 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 provide, to provide the new goods of the industrial revolution. With that last question, we have come to an end to the lecture. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Angel. And we will remind you everyone that we will continue uh, on Thursday. We will have Tarles Pereira, who will be talking more in depth about the Brazilian case, the Brazilian independence, its effects and its causes. Thank you very much.